Uh, good evening. It is an, an honor to be here. Uh, I'm delighted to have a chance to speak with you. And uh, let me say, I, I'm an honored to be affiliated with the, the UBS uh, Economics uh, Center. I actually had the, uh, the pleasure of giving the UBS Economics and Society lecture in 2016 in Zurich. Uh, I've worked with and uh, known Ernst for many years. I uh, served on the UBS Advisory Board, and as Ernst mentioned, uh, one of my closest collaborators uh, is David Dorn, who's a faculty member uh, at the uh, at the UBS uh, Zurich uh, Economics Department. So uh, I've uh, benefited in many ways and learned a great deal along the way. Um, so now I want to speak to you about the work of the future and shaping technology and institutions. So let me just dive right in, and then I'll tell you what I'm talking about after a couple of minutes. Um, so if you think about it, um, Many of the great innovations of the last 200 years were designed specifically to replace labor, to substitute machines for labor. So the tractor was built to replace animal and human muscular power with uh, internal combustion power. The assembly line was designed to replace uh, slow, uh, inaccurate uh, artisanal labor with machine precision. Um, the digital computer was meant to eliminate cumbersome, error-prone human calculation and replace it with a digital perfection. And these inventions have worked. Uh, we no longer dig ditches by hands. We don't pound tools out of wrought iron. We don't do bookkeeping using actual books. So we have displaced an enormous amount of labor from extremely labor-intensive activities. We have made ourselves obsolete in many of the things we used to do. And yet, over the last 130 years, by and large, the fraction of adults working in the paid labor market has risen in almost every decade and in almost every uh, advanced economy. Now, an important part of that, of course, reflects the movement of women out of unpaid, restrictive, grueling labor in the household into market work where they can do uh, more creative, uh, you know, more educated and more varied work. So we have somehow not made ourselves irrelevant or obsolete despite all this successful innovation designed at displacing labor. So what I want to talk about tonight are really four things. One is I want to say, well, why in broadest terms are there still so many jobs? Why after 200 years of incredible innovation have we failed to make ourselves irrelevant? Second, I want to talk specifically about the emergence of new work because it's easy to think that uh, as we automate, we just do a narrower and narrower set of things that remain. That turns out not to be true, and I want to illustrate that point. Third, I want to ask, well, if we're not worried about the amount of work, what should we be worried about? And I wouldn't want you to leave here tonight without having something to worry about. So I will talk about what I do think is worth worrying about, and I think there's a lot. And finally, I want to talk about how we shape the future. Uh, a lot of discussion about the future of work is about reacting to the things that are going to happen. And that actually is, uh, that's starting too late in the process because we have a lot of control over what we experience. It's not just reacting to, but actually shaping the institutions and the technologies themselves in ways that we feel good about. So I will talk about that as well. So first, let me say, why are there still, still so many jobs? And let me give you a sort of a short two-part answer. So the first one, I'm gonna call complementarity. Uh, so here's a, a well-known example from James Besson, who's an economic historian uh, at uh, Boston University. And this shows the introduction of the automated teller machine uh, in the United States. So ATMs are those, you know, those vending machines that dispense cash. And as they were introduced uh, in the early 70s and through the 80s and 2000s, the number of bank tellers employed rose, not fell, as ATMs were introduced, which kind of raises the question of what were all those bank tellers doing and why weren't they made irrelevant exactly? Well, just as you would expect, when ATMs were brought into banks, they reduced the number of tellers per branch by about a third a lot of the work, in fact, had been mechanized. However, banks quickly discovered that with, with fewer tellers in a machine, they could branch at lower cost, and they started branching extensively and introducing more branches. So that increased teller employment. But that story is too simple, because it wasn't just the number of tellers, but the type of work that they were doing that was changed. They went from, essentially, tellers were mostly kind of checkout clerks for money. Uh, they became problem solvers. Uh, you know, fixing, you know, helping customers figure out what's wrong with their accounts and introducing them to new products and services like, you know, credit cards or investments or loans. So um, it didn't just change the number of workers, it changed the nature of the work. And in fact, it increased the value of problem solving, 
of interpersonal skills uh, and of sales themselves directly as the work changed. Now, the ATM example is, you know, not, not everything looks like that. It's just one specific example, but it illustrates a broad principle, which is that most work involves a kind of a range of tasks, uh, things from the very basic to the intellectually intensive, from the, you know, perspiration and inspiration, or, you know, from the mundane to uh, the uh, sublime. And um, in general, all of those tasks need to be accomplished to get the work done. You can't just do more of one and fewer of the other. What that means is that as we automate some set of subset of tasks, the tasks that remain become more valuable, right? Because they're complementary. And in general, the tasks that remain uh, in, in an age of automation, and especially digital automation, are those that require expertise, those that require judgment, and those that require creativity. So let me define those terms. Expertise is a, a learned body of knowledge. Right? It could be knowledge of banking, it could be knowledge of research, it could be knowledge of uh, broadcast journalism. Um, but uh, expertise is, uh, is a beginning, but it's not enough. To use expertise effectively, you need judgment. You need to know how to apply it. So for example, I could sit down in front of a legal database and I would have all the legal expertise uh, in the world immediately in front of me, but I would have no idea how to be a lawyer. Right? So judgment is taking going from a body of expert knowledge to a specific problem and applying it correctly. Then creativity is worth taking that same expertise and judgment and applying it to a new domain, which you're not familiar, to produce a new idea or a new insight. So in general, automation doesn't just substitute us, it complements us. And the way it complements us, by and large, is by increasing the value of our expertise, judgment, and creativity. And because of uh, it makes us more efficient in these things, the leverage, the value of making the right decision increases as we have more scope, more resources, more power at our command, more things that depend on us you know, pressing the right key, uh, making the right investment, and so on. So that's part of it. So that describes a type of work that becomes more important as we automate. But you might say, well, what about the amount of work? Like, uh, isn't it kind of self-evident that if we become sufficiently productive at something, we're sort of out of a job? And you can see this. So in 1900, 38% of all U.S. employment was in agriculture, was on farms. Uh, by the year uh, 2010, that was 2%, and it's fallen in the, uh, since that time. Now, that reflects, you know, over a century of progress in fertilization, in mechanization, in uh, genetics, and... Um, even uh, in irrigation. Um, so that's amazing. And we are now at a point where a few million farmers can feed a population of over 320 million people and export a lot of food, actually. Um, so that's remarkable progress. On the other hand, it does mean there really aren't that many farming jobs remaining. And what's happened in farming is not unique. In general, um, there are lots of sectors, lots of services that eventually become so productive in doing them that there are relatively few people remaining to do the work. But what is true about a single sector or a single service has never been true about the economy as a whole. Because as our wealth rises and as the scope of things we can do expands, we create new products, new services, new ideas that occupy our attention, that spur consumption, and that ultimately create demand for labor. Many of the products that people spend their money on, right? So, you know, air conditioning, sport utility vehicles, uh, mobile electronics. They didn't exist 100 years ago. Many of the industries that employ large numbers of people, you know, health services, uh, you know, uh, software development, uh, many areas of finance were minute a century ago, and now they're major employers. Right? So it would be in theoretically possible that, you know, we get wealthy enough, we displace work out of agriculture, and no one wants to buy anything anymore, and therefore there's no demand. But we've never seen anything that looks like that. People's consumption seems to rise, or at least the desire for consumption, rises about you know, kind of 1.1 times the rate of growth of their incomes. <laughs> uh, and so uh, people seem to have inexhaustible demand. There has never been a society that said, we're wealthy enough, we're done innovating, let's all stay home and relax. Right? Doesn't happen. So, uh, so, the second, so these two factors together, one, um, complementarity, so automation makes our work more valuable, and two, insatiability, meaning that as our incomes rise, we demand more new things, and especially made feasible by technology, means we're not going to run out of work. And there's no evidence that we're running out of work. 
But let me deal, drill down on this question a little further and talk about the emergence of new work. So it's easy to have the picture in mind that we automate more and more things and people are left doing a narrower set of jobs that are, you know, they're more productive at them, but, but ultimately they're doing, you know, just one thing like very, very efficiently. And that's actually not what is happening. So let me talk about the emergence of new work. And I want to talk about four sources of new work. Where does new work come from? Some of them are obvious and some of them I think are a little less obvious. So the first one I'm going to call Uber effects. You could just as well call these ATM effects. And these are when you get more productive at something, even though you do it more efficiently, often you end up with more employment in that very activity. So, for example, uh, in New York, in just three years, excuse me, you can't see this number of taxi trips driven fell from about 475,000 to about 280,000, right? So a substantial reduction. That reflected the effect of Uber. However, if you look at Uber and Lyft trips and add those to taxi trips, it essentially doubled the number of car hail, of, of tra personal transportation trips. So this is a pure demand effect, right? You learn to do something more efficiently, the price falls, the convenience increases, and even though for any given ride you actually need less labor because there's less time spent waiting around, the number of rides grows so fast that you actually have more workers doing it, right? So that's what happened with the ATMs, that's what happened with Uber. That's not all of it. Let's take another effect, pure effect of lowering prices. So in the US, Walmart, you know, a major driver of low prices, they were very efficient at sourcing from China, uh, from developing logistics networks and so on. Well, so that saved people money on necessities. Well, what did they do with that money? Well, it's America. They spent it, right? So uh, if you look, um, the fraction, uh, if you look at uh, just over the period of a century, in 1900, people in the U.S. spent 80% of all income on just three things, which are food, clothing, and housing, right? There really wasn't anything left over for luxuries. By 2000, that had fallen to approximately 50% meaning 30% of all income uh, was now disposable, was no longer needed just to meet necessities. Now, you could imagine that people would save it and there'd be less labor demand, but in fact, as I said, uh, American savings rates are about negative 5%, as far as I can tell, and so, of course, consumption rose uh, just as fast as prices fell, and the net result was just a proliferation of new goods, new activities, and, of course, more. That's the second factor. So pure, the pure effect of rising income uh, raises, raises demand. The third is what I'm going to call network effects. So uh, between 1980 and 2017, the number of labor hours required to make a ton of steel uh, fell from 10 to one and a half. So if previously, you know, you had 100 workers making steel, um, you would only need 15 to make the same amount of steel, right? Clearly, that's going to be a case where output is going to rise so fast that employment in steel is going to fall, right? So there are approximately, f there are fewer than 400,000 steel workers remaining in the United States, which is a small number, and it would be much larger if productivity growth hadn't risen so fast. So is that a job killer? Well, think about the fact that there are over 4 million jobs in steel-using industries, right? In aircraft, in fabricated metal, in machinery, in motor vehicles, in aerospace products, right? And when productivity rises in steel, that means the price of steel falls, which means that all of the price of these products will also be at fall, which means that we'll build more buildings, we'll build more airplanes, right? we'll make more machinery. Moreover, if you work in mining and you're pulling ore out of the ground or you're, develop, or you're providing electricity or tr logistics and transportation, those inputs will also rise because the amount of steel will go up as the price falls. So even as productivity rises rapidly in one sector, and reduces employment in that sector, that in general will raise not lower employment in aggregate because of these network effects, because your customers get a cheaper product and because your suppliers get more demand. So those are three of the forces. Let me now talk about the fourth, the invention of new work. And I think this is, this is the most mysterious and in some ways uh, the most interesting, in some ways the most amusing as well. Um, and this refers to uh, work that I, ongoing work I'm doing with uh, Anna Solomons of the uh, Utrecht University. And, um, we, um, building on work by a clever paper by an economist named Jeffrey Lin of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, he, he noticed that, you know, the U.S. Census Bureau, you know, they have to list everyone's occupation. When, when you fill out the census form, it says, what do you do? And then you write in your job. You say, I'm a teacher, you know, I drive a truck, I, you know, clean houses, whatever. And the Census Bureau has to code that and assign it a, a, a one of three, a three-digit code. So it'll be three or four or 500 occupations, uh, depending on what decade it is. 
However, to facilitate that coding, they have a much longer list of typically 15 to 35,000 detailed occupational titles. Um, and those are to help the people who read the write-ins determine what broad category to assign them to. So those people do this for a living, but of course, every once in a while, they encounter something they haven't seen before. And when they encounter it enough times, they bring it to the attention of their supervisor. Supervisor looks at it and says, oh yeah, we should add this to the catalog. Um, and so using these successive catalogs of titles, you can start to see the emergence of new work. Not only you know, that there is new work, but what does it look like? Where is it happening? So many people, when they think about new work, they sort of imagine high tech, what we call frontier work. Right? So, you know, you're, you know, everyone believes their kid needs to be a, you know, an artificial intelligence programmer or a botnet herder or, you know, amateur roboticist by the time they're 12, right? And whenever you think about new work, you imagine high-tech stuff, right? So let me get, and, and there is a lot of that. Let me give you an example of that. So uh, here are some new work titles. So you've all, you all know George Jetson, right? The Hanna-Barbera campaign, right? And, and uh, he, by the way, his job was a professional button pusher. Right, that's what he did. He'd go to the office and press a button all day long. So that's the, the, the narrowing scope of work. Okay, so here are some job titles added to the US Census. Uh, uh, in 1980, supervisor of word processing, right? So that was a frontier job at that time. Um, circuit layout designers in 1990. Artificial intelligence specialists in 2000. So this is interesting. They're actually pretty good at picking this stuff up. Um, uh, echocardiographers in 2000. Uh, wind turbine technicians in 2010. Uh, computing services directors in 20, not 2106, <laughs> 2016. Um, so absolutely, you do see new work emerging that involves creating the new technology, um, installing and integrating the new technology, or even applying it to some other domain, like ethnocardiographers, echocardiographers, excuse me. However, that's really not the limit of it. Um, another category of work, as you'll see, has nothing to do with new technology per se. There's a lot of creation in specialty services that have no specific technological component, but clearly reflect either rising wealth or changing demographics. So here's some examples. Um, uh, so this is George Jetson at home, of course, with Rosie the Robot. Um, so in 1980, a new job was a gift wrapper. Uh, in 1990, a fingernail former. Uh, in 2000, a horse exerciser and the ever popular oyster preparer. Um, in 2010, a sommelier, so let me be clear, we know that sommeliers have been around you know, since the, the, you know, the founding of France or Italy and so on, but in the United States, that was a new job, right? We, we, <laughs> prior to that, we were just getting wine out of boxes. Um, and of course, 2016, you know, recognizing the Trump election, golf cart mechanic also became a new job, right? So there's a lot of new work that in fact is not about technology per se, but it's about the creation of new uh, of new luxuries, of new services, right, that reflect disposable income. Let me finally say, and this is important, there's another category of work that, that we try to classify, what we call last mile jobs. These are jobs, formerly robust jobs, that had a lot of tasks that are kind of fading away, and there's just a little bit left of those jobs. There's actually a really interesting book on this subject uh, by uh, an a, um, anthropologist named Mary Gray called Ghost Work, where she describes the kind of online work platforms like uh, Mechanical Turk, or uh, uh, Odesk, now called Upwork, where basically little bits of work are sold, often internationally, often you know, micro tasks. So you can see some of these in the census. It's not, it's not so obvious, many of them are done overseas, but for example, in, oh, by the way, <laughs> just thought I'd give you another example of Jetsons, right? So these are the robotic football players. For some reason, you need a robotic football player winder. So that's the last mile job. Presumably that will be automated and eventually this guy will be out of work. So uh, in 1980, a uh, tamale machine feeder uh, was a new job. Uh, a vending machine, a right, someone who, f who puts food into the vending machine. Uh, a chat room host monitor, that's a new job actually uh, that is a, uh, requires a certain set of skills. Uh, undergrad utility cable locators and teleprompters, right, with a person who shows you your cue cards as you speak. So just to sum up, um, the, uh, uh, I, I want, so the three points I've made so far, one is, one is that automation doesn't just eliminate work, it complements what remains. Two is, even as productivity rises, consumption r tends to rise in lockstep, meaning it creates new work. And three is, it's not just more of the same. Our inventiveness, our creativity, and our sort of insatiability means that we are constantly creating new activities uh, that have, you know, either uh, that have you know, important 
Uh, social value, for example, is all kinds of new specialties in medicine, or important are just consumption value. Um, but so human creativity is very much in evidence, uh, in evidence when you look through this. So now when we come to the question is, if, you know, if there's going to be employment, there's going to be new jobs, is it all good? Is, is, are we all wasting our time? Should you even be here worrying about the future work tonight? Or should we have just told you don't worry and sent you home? Um, well, if you look at The Economist in uh, May of 2019, uh, they would say there's nothing to worry about, right? Uh, across the rich world, an extraordinary job boom is underway. You know, everyone's, uh, the zeitgeist has lost touch with the data. Everyone is concerned about nothing. Just go home. Uh, you know, relax, watch TV, focus on something else. Um, I'm one of the co-directors of the MIT Work of the Future Task Force that was tasked to look at this question, and uh, we disagree with the economists. We think there's something to worry about. Um, but it's not running out of jobs. In our view, and I don't think this is controversial, you know, work is a central human activity. It's critical to self-realization. It's critical to social cohesion. People understand that work has value beyond just supporting consumption. It gives people identity. It gives them a sense of purpose. It gives them a structure. It gives them a social community with whom they uh, with whom they relate, and it gives them public esteem. You are esteemed for your work. Um, the last four decades of economic history show that you can have a lot of technological progress without unemployment, without rising unemployment, a lot of productivity growth without a lot of shared prosperity, and that is the source for concern. In other words, there's no certainty that all of the productivity growth we're seeing will generate benefits for the majority of citizens. So let me show you a figure from the US. This figure shows you uh, the rise of total factor productivity from 1948 to approximately the present. That's the green line. The next line, the dark blue line, excuse me, the purple line, is the, um, uh, the, pro, pro, the compensation of, uh, of supervisory workers, so managers and professionals. And then you have the, the compensation of the median worker or the compensation of a kind of a blue collar worker. So you can see, first of all, from that blue line, there's been an enormous amount of productivity growth. It was slower after the mid 1970s, but uh, it was not zero. From the end of the Second World War to about 1978, 1980, productivity growth and the wage of the median worker rose in lockstep. So if we were having this discussion in 1978, I could say to you, look, nothing to worry about here. Activity rises, everyone benefits, the typical worker benefits. But now we look from mid-1970s forward and productivity continues to rise, but there's a radical divergence, right? So highly educated workers, this purple line here, are absolutely benefiting from rising productivity, but the median worker or the 60th percentile worker or the 30th or 20th percentile worker are not. And so this makes clear that it's not sufficient to have an a sufficient, is not sufficient just to have jobs and even to have technology that raises productivity and therefore national income, that does not guarantee that we will have shared prosperity, that we'll have a set of outcomes that are broadly beneficial. And so my own interpretation of people's worry about the future of work is they're not worried per se that there's not work. They're worried about the fact that there can be lots of progress that will not benefit the, them. And the last four decades of history, especially in the United States, to larger, you know, it varies countries demonstrate that that concern is legitimate that's a that's a really that's a the evidence supports that worry let me show you just a couple man, other manifestations of this this just shows you the massive rise of earnings inequality by education in the United States from approximately 1980 forward the real earnings of people with college or uh, graduate education has risen strongly and steadily the real earnings of men especially with high school or lower education has fallen substantially in real terms Right? Despite all this productivity growth, uh, it, you know, fortunately uh, for Switzerland, for most other countries, it, the picture doesn't look nearly as extreme once you, uh, you know, move out of the cowboy capitalism of my particular country. Um, but all countries have faced this challenge to some degree. Some have pushed back against it more successfully. Um, a third aspect of this is if you look at the growth of jobs by wage level, it looks extremely bimodal. So on the one hand, we have lots of growth in professional, technical, and managerial work. Highly paid, highly educated work, interesting, creative, secure. We also have a lot of growth of in-person services, food service, cleaning, security, entertainment, recreation, transportation, home health care. Um, these jobs 
by and large, use a fairly generic skill set. You don't require specialized training to do them. That means you, you typically don't become a great deal more productive over time as you do them. And that means that wages will not grow over the life cycle if you're not better. And moreover, you won't have much job security because the next person who wants to do your job can do it just about as well as you can, or at least in the course of a couple of weeks. We have a lot of growth in that. What is declining rapidly in all advanced economies are both production jobs and uh, skilled office work. Both of these were middle skill work done by non-college workers where you had specialization, you had rising skills over the life cycle, and along with that would go rising earnings and increasing job security. So the decline of this middle, and I'll say, you see this across the, uh, the developed world, is, a re is an important contributor to this bifurcation, to growth at the top and not at the median. The sources of this are not mysterious. A lot of them reflect automation that does, in fact, substitute for people doing codifiable work, either repetitive assembly work or office work where there are well understood rules and procedures that describe how do you sort, how do you file, how do you calculate, uh, how do you retrieve information. Um, but it really creates a challenge because it shrinks the size of the middle class, it kind of knocks out rungs on the economic ladder and potentially reduces the odds that people go from rags to riches. This is a problem that every country faces to some degree. Some have done a much better job at preserving income equality even as the quality of jobs have diverged. In some countries like the United States, it's really translated one for one. As the quality of jobs has diverged, incomes have diverged simultaneously. Finally, and this is a really important mystery, um, productivity growth itself has slowed dramatically since 2005. So this shows you productivity growth between 2005 and 2015 relative to a decade earlier. And every country on this list, except for Spain, mysteriously, en or not, uh, mysteriously enough, is below zero, including Switzerland right there, um, I've circled. So we don't understand why productivity growth has slowed. But that's a problem for all of us. Productivity growth, as I said, is not sufficient to create rising pros shared prosperity, but it is necessary. And so is an important puzzle why in this age of what we perceive to be great innovation, we don't see a lot of that represented in the data. Um, so here are the challenges and opportunities as I see them. So one, of course, is keeping skills rising at the paces of, advance, of technological advancement. So in the US, for example, we know that a lot of the rise of inequality started when the slowdown in production of college workers began. So all of a sudden, cohorts after the, uh, the Vietnam War, they, they were going to college less. The actual rate of college attainment fell. And when supply didn't keep up with demand, inequality rose. The, the premium to education rose greatly. Um, this is, college, of course, is by no means a sufficient answer to the skill challenge, right? In fact, arguably the US overinvests in college. Switzerland does a better job at investing at various levels. But there's no question that the types of changes we will see ahead will require people to adapt. It's not that they will run out of jobs, but they may have to do different jobs than they did 10 years earlier. And that means creating a, a vocational and a skills training system that allows people to reinvest, uh, to reskill. And that means having many lateral points of entry, and it means having educational programs that are targeted to adults, not just early learners, not just to students. And the way adults learn is different from the way young people learn. Adults, you know, once they've been in the labor force for a while, they typically don't want to spend a month in a classroom watching a person writing on a chalkboard and taking notes, right? They want a much more targeted educational experience. That's something that we know how to do, but that's not what all the systems deliver. Right? So skilling is one part of it, but of course it's easy. Everybody says, oh, invest in skill. Should, but that's far from enough. A second thing we need to do is actually align the incentives to invest in human capital and physical capital. In almost every advanced country, we give very substantial tax breaks, uh, breaks to investments in capital or the, to the owners of capital in the form of capital returns, but we don't give similar incentives to human capital investment. And as a result, our tax code at the margin subsidizes uh, uh, organizations that want to buy a machine to replace a worker. And some of that is productive and some of that is excessive. But if the tax code is always tilted towards investment in physical capital relative to human capital, we're going to get too much physical capital relative to human capital. And uh, this figure just shows you, uh, I won't go into detail, this notion of that there's been more worker displacement than there has been new task creation. 
And what we need to understand, I think this is, this is too often forgotten, is invention or innovation is not an autonomous activity. It doesn't just happen from people sitting in labs going, Eureka, here's a new technology. Right? People innovate, the, what they innovate on is affected by tax incentives, it's affected by what governments subsidize in universities through their R&D programs, through their military programs. It's affected by people's own ideas of what is important to work on. And so a lot of innovation is targeted at labor replacement rather than labor augmentation. Um, and yet there's a lot of labor augmentation that would be extremely beneficial. It would be great if we could make people more productive in home health care. It would be great if we could make people more productive in food service and cleaning work. It would, make, it would be great if we could make people more productive in taking care of human needs. But that's not where most innovation is directed. Uh, and that is within our control. Third, and this is really important, when you think about you know, a scarcity of jobs, you should be flipping that on its head. You should be thinking about a scarcity of workers. Let me make this clear. In every advanced economy, the age dependency ratio is rising steeply. So, for example, uh, in Switzerland, it's predicted to rise from 25 to about 40 uh, in, the next, uh, 20, in the next 30 years. That means that there will be 40 people over age 65 for every 100 people who are currently working. That creates a real challenge uh, because the care needs are substantial and the number of people available to both do the care and pay the taxes is constrained. And because we have low and falling fertility in most wealthy economies, reduced immigration, and on top of that, um, strongly rising education, which makes people less inclined to want to do this care work, we're going to face labor scarcity. Uh, we're going to face a shortage of able-bodied people who want to do a lot of the important work that needs to be done. Now, that's a challenge. It's also an opportunity, because it means we're going to have to make people much more productive in that work. And we're going to have to pay them a lot more to do it. So if we're going to have to pay them a lot more, we better make them more productive. So I think when, when I think about the, the labor market challenges ahead, they are not one of uh, too many workers chasing a few jobs. They are too many jobs chasing a scarcity of workers. And if this seems fantastical to you, spend a week in aging Japan, and you will see precisely what I mean, both the pressure this creates on the labor market and the enormous pressure it creates for automation as well. Um, finally, we need to figure out how to steer innovation towards things that raise productivity. And it's easy to perceive that we're in an age of incredible technological progress. But actually, if you reflect for a moment and think about the innovations of throughout the 20th century, the introduction of you know, the automobile, of electric lighting, of, air, uh, of airplanes and jets, of uh, indoor plumbing that massively increased sanitation, those, those technological changes were transformational, both for productivity and for the quality of life that people experience. The, many of the innovations we see today are super cool, <laughs> um, but it's not clear they're nearly as transformational or that they're being applied to the most important problems. You know, I, you know, I, I love you know, Siri on my phone. I love, you know, I love the fact that I can type three words into Google and it guesses what I mean, Get, but that's not uh, going to have a first order effect on national productivity. And so, um, but that's, of course, that's where the incentives of the commercial market go, but that's not where they have to go. That's something we can shape through policy and what government have, has always identifying major challenges and focusing attention and research and resources on those problems. Okay, so let me kind of conclude. Um, so really four points I want to make. First, that which I hope I, I've, I've stressed enough, the challenge is not a scarcity of jobs. Um, but abundant jobs do not guarantee abundant good jobs. Right now, in most countries, we have an abundance of high-skill professional technical work. That's great. People have great careers. We have an abundance of jobs in food service and cleaning and security. Those are also good jobs, but they are not economically secure. They don't tend to pay well, and they don't offer rising incomes and security over time. That's a problem that we should work on. Third, Abundant technology does not by itself even guarantee faster productivity growth or shared prosperity. It needs to be directed, and that's something we can do. Uh, so we should not think our job is simply to react to the technology, but also to direct where we innovate. So finally, I want to say the future will not take care of itself. It's not a problem that will solve itself, nor has it ever done that. So final example I'll end with, um, you know, in the, uh, in the early 
20th century, as I showed you, U.S. agriculture was declining at a phenomenally rapid rate. So farm employment was falling about a half percentage point per year between uh, 1900 and 1940. Um, People in the U.S. farm states looked around and they recognized that things were changing fast. And they were concerned that their own children would not be prepared for the thing that was ahead. They wouldn't be needed on the farm. And uh, what would else would they be trained to do if not work on the farm? And so many U.S. farm states did something really radical, which is they passed laws requiring that their children stay in school until the age of 16. Why was this radical? Well, you had to hire teachers, you had to build buildings, you had to buy books, but the biggest cost was your kids couldn't work on the farm from age 10 forward as they normally would have done. Many people looked around, especially looking from, uh, you know, looking from Europe and said, that's crazy. Why does everyone need this high level skill? Why does everyone need to be both literate and numerate? Aren't you kind of putting the cart before the horse here, getting far ahead of yourselves? Well, arguably, it was one of the greatest invent investments the U.S. made in the 20th century. It gave us the most flexible, the most productive, um, the most, uh, the most um, agile workforce in the modern world at that time and, and allowed the U.S. to grow rapidly, to innovate, and in fact to adapt really quickly. Part of the reason the U.S. was so fast to mobilize for World War II when it finally chose to do so is because it had enough skilled workers to build out factories at a phenomenal rate. So, the point I want to make there is the lesson of history. People have been worried about this problem for 200 years. And we can look around and say, well, things seem fine now, so they shouldn't have been worrying. But that's not right. It was their worrying that turned out to be productive. It was exactly responding to that challenge that caused the kind of broad social investments that allowed us to take advantage of the new opportunities that were presented to us by these technological changes that we created. And when we look forward, we are going to have lots of new technology, and we're going to have a lot of productivity growth. But whether we make the most of that opportunity to create shared prosperity and uh, a society that, uh, that you know, allows us to pursue the democratic and social values that we esteem depends on the choices that we make at present and going forward. Thank you very, very much.